Hello everyone and welcome in this video about convolutional neural networks. I will try to present the basics and the application of the models so that you can easily use them in the future architectures you will create. First of all, what and where are convolutional neural networks? In fact, you may already have heard of convolutional neural networks, CNN or ConvNet, and they are all exactly the same thing. What we call a convolutional network is a simple neural network where you have at least one convolutional operation. So as you can see here, I have one here, one here, and three fully connected layers. As soon as you have at least one convolutional operation, your model is a CNN. What are the principles behind convolutions? Well, let's consider that you have here a simple image of the Eiffel Tower, 475 pixels by 625. In fact, what you will see is that this image is composed of three different colors that we will call channels, which are red, green, and blue. A 2D image, in fact, with three channels. What we do, a convolutional network, is making a small scanner that we will call a kernel, as you can see here, that will try to detect features in your image. So it's a simply 2D shape, so also you have a 2D image, so you create a 2D kernel, which has also three channels. And you will pass it everywhere on your image, the same kernel, to make it able to detect the feature on all the image. So if one feature is detected at one point, it will also be detected at another one. But how comes that a kernel can detect a feature? For that, the kernel will be containing several parameters that will be trained by the neural networks, as you see here, and each element of the kernel will be compared to the pixels you have of the image. The closer you are from the kernel, like here, where you have values that are very close, the stronger the signal will be. As the opposite, if you have pixels that are not close to the feature the kernel is looking for, like you can have here, you would get a poor signal. And I will demonstrate here how the signal is in fact detected by the kernel. So I will use here a um, simple kernel, which helps to detect uh, vertical lines, as you can see. And it is repeated in all three channels. So in fact, it would be like working on a um, grayscale image. And what we will have is a specific output image that will print a very high value where a vertical line is detected and you can see it with the different line of the Eiffel Tower. What's important here is like you have only a single image, which is some kind of a grayscale image from zero to one, or it can be over one as we will see and as we have already seen before. And each pixel, the whiter it is, the stronger the signal is. So I use it as a representation, but in fact, the whiter means the stronger the signal. And what we can do is not applying only one type of scanner, so this scanner has been repeated to generate this image, but multiple of them. And we will do it with an horizontal one, like here, where you can see that we are able to detect a horizontal line, like you see here with the second floor, so that we were not able with the vertical one. And this is what basically the kernels will be simply a small number of parameters trained to detect specific features, as you can see here with horizontal line after the vertical, and we will generate more and more with different parameters. What we can remember is that we applied different type of kernels on a single same input. In fact, using four different kernels at a simple layer will give us four new channels which already detected features. And the strength we will have about convolutions is not only about detecting one features, but being able to stack convolutions. If you have here features detected in the first layer as horizontal and vertical lines, and you get this output. So we already had the input layers. We have here the result of the first layer. And we see here that we have different elements detected as vertical lines. And at other places, we have horizontal lines. What we will be able by using the output of the first layer, so instead of channels here that contains colors, they contain features, we are able to combine them to detect the fact that we have two vertical lines that are represented. And we can do exactly the same with the horizontal line. What we can show here is that 
from simple vertical and horizontal line, we are able to detect complex structures like a square as the second layer. And this is exactly what you can see here on these images where you have a neural network, a convolutional neural network that has been trained on faces where you have at the beginning very basic line like the vertical I mentioned before or the horizontal one, even some uh, round shapes. And after by combining them, the second layer is able to detect specific areas of face like the eyes, the nose, uh, even somehow the mouse here. And by combining them again, it would be able to detect faces and to recognize people or maybe recognize their emotions. Uh, we can see here like somebody is frowning while he, or maybe just a bird or uh, somebody is more like smiling here. Doing this, the more we stack convolutions, the more we are able to detect complex structures. However, there is some kind of a trick with convolutions. One of the main errors we see is that if we have a very close feature from the tensor, we will get a very strong signal. But what if you move just slightly the feature? You won't get any result. And it's great to be able to differentiate between things, but sometimes, like if I do here, I try to detect the eyes with very big kernels. I have two eyes here, and in fact, this eye is just a bit moved downward. It could be just a few pixels. In fact, doing this, the kernel is not able to detect the signal. One of the tips to remedy this is to increase the number of parameters that are detected in the kernel, uh, like this one here, that we'll be able to detect here. And in fact, by doing these specific operations, I'm able to detect both of them. So there are some kind of equivalent and I'm able to detect the feature. However, I'm losing as precision, which is not exactly the worst. Uh, the problem is that uh, I will need to train a kernel that is not able to differentiate both of them. So the tips we may have would be to create two kernels uh, that would be anyway trained by the neural networks. However, this system is not efficient because you will have very different kernels that use a specific number of space from the parameters that we try to differentiate. And what we will do, in fact, is prefer this kind of architectures where the kernel are very looking for specific features. So this model is better than these two, which are equivalents. How can we do that? If we consider a specific input, a tool has been used, uh, which is called the pooling convolution. The purpose of a pooling convolution is to apply a kernel, which will not apply convolution, but will just look at the maximum value we have to create a new output. So let's imagine here you have your neural networks, you have different layers, and you have this in, uh, input value of the pooling convolution. You start here by looking at the four cells you have here, you have the one, which means that you will pull it and get one. And after we just slide, so here the maximum value is 0, 5, 0, 5, and then it goes 0, 5, 1, 0, 0, and so on. And what you will get is a specific image that try to get the value around the pixels to allow some kind of fuzzy mechanism that will allow the networks to learn better. However, as you can see, I came here from a five by four inputs and I will get a four by three output. So the polling convolution lost in resolution and a bit changed the structure of the data. As you will see, we can do some padding that will help to keep the structure of the data. But what you should remember is that every time you use a pooling, you will lose some kind of resolution. You will know very well what is around the pixels, but not much what was behind the pooling. There is some kind of loss which can have very good advantages if we are not looking for very high precision, but may have a drawback that we will lose this precision that we may need on some other places. Okay, we have done the basics of it. Uh, now I will present the Conf2D network that is proposed by Bytorch. And if you can understand it, you can very easily understand how it works even for TensorFlow. We will review the parameters together so you can know how to create your own convolution on your networks. I use the conf 2 d but can be expressed as one-dimensional neural networks, as we will see afterwards, if you do some kind of a sequence analysis, or it could be as a 3D convolutional neural networks if you are looking for some specific volumes in space. We start by the in-channel. If you remember, you have three different channels. In fact, this represents uh, what you have as input. At the beginning, I will use just the red, green, and blue colors if I have a colored image. I could even use the alpha colors, even if for this one, maybe some kind of attention mechanism would be, would be better. 
And what I will do afterwards will be to use the output I have. So when I stack a second convolution, I will use in fact the out channels I have that are represented by all the images that came from the kernels as an input channel. I start with the input channels and in fact my out channels variable represent the number of kernels and the numbers of different images I will output at the end of the convolutional layer. So remember that very well. The more you increase here the value, the more you will have parameters, which means the more you will be able to detect different features at this level. Next, we have the kernel size. Here I will represent a two by two kernels. Remember that your kernel size must be of the same size. If here I have a 2D images, I will need to have a 2D kernel. As you can see here, the pixels is not represented correctly, but this is what will pass on all the images to output the features. And it can be a two by two or a two by three or even a three by three. What matters is that you always have two dimensions. And in fact, they will create a specific depth of the kernel size that represents the number of input channels everywhere. Next, we have a number called the stride. The stride is quite easy to understand. It's just how the kernel will slide on your image. So here I will just present a stride one, which is a basic one, where you just slide from one cell to another. If I take a stride two, you will see that I will not go from here to here. I will skip it and directly jump, letting this. This may be helpful if you are not looking for specific details, but this will also increase the size of the image you output. If you do some kind of specific segmentation where you try to detect on a specific area of your image where are the elements, you will not be willing to have a stride too high. But if you're just looking in an image saying, I want to know just if there is a cat, you may try to increase the stride as you will have less parameters and the computation might be faster. The problem with the sliding kernel is mainly about the angles because if we have here a kernel sliding, you will see that we only go on each corner one time, which may lose some kind of information. Also, if you have your kernel that moves from here, you see that it will go one, two, three, four times, which means that from five by five image, we will get a four by four. Applying a convolution decreases the dimensions you have. And this might be an issue if you want to detect specific areas that have the same space of your image. To remedy this problem, you can use the padding. And padding will simply be by adding extra cells on the corner that you will fill with the padding mod equals zero. So here I fill it with zero, but you have different other structures that will try to repeat the patterns you have on the corner of the images. And what you will have here is the kernel starting from another position that is filled with zero here, but it will have at least the time to output once what this part of the kernel detects so that we can use it at the first time here, next year, next year, next year. That provides us to read these pixels four times while it would not be possible otherwise to review all the points that we have in the corners. And as I mentioned before, what we do is simply filling the value of this area by zero. And this is what is provided by the padding on zeros. In TensorFlow, mainly with the library Keras, you may have heard of the padding same or valid. Same means that you will just apply a padding one here. And the valid one is just about sliding on the correct pixels, but not adding any more padding around. In TensorFlow, the same padding will give you the same shape of the image as output as you had in input. With PyTorch, you have uh, just a way to correct it with padding equals zero equals one. The dilation is about the value you have between each element of the kernel. We have here dilation one, but if we get a dilation two, I will not go from one point to another. I will just jump one point and go on the second one. And by dilation three, I will skip to three. These elements help to detect uh, specific patterns that can be very far from your image to combine very extreme signals to combine them together. And it is very well used in the treatment of vocal signal to be able to transform a voice from someone to someone else. And it has been very well used in the model called WaveNet from DeepMind, where you can see here that we start with a very simple dilation of one, and we will progressively increase the dilation so that at the end, we only use two different inputs 
but that covers in fact all the points we have here. So we do not have a lot of parameters that are used and we are able to stack informations from very different parts of the raw signal we treat. And this is very well used, as I mentioned before, for treatment of audio signals. I mentioned also, as a side note, that we have here a 1D convolution. We only use one dimension here, we do not have two. In fact, we have one convolution here and we will stack convolution of 1D. But we could have also multiple channels here, it would not change anything. This remains a one dimension convolution. Groups are not very well used today, but they have been and you may still find some usage of it. The main idea is that if you have a kernel that will be repeated every time on your images, so let's say we have here four different kernels and group one, all four kernels will slide on the image and try to detect every part. If you do a group equals four, what you will have if you have only four channels is that each specific kernel will look at only a part of the image. So that could be somehow useful if you want to have a splitting camera that look at different elements and combine them. However, we may still prefer to have a different kind of architectures that looks at different parts, but this is absolutely a way to stack them. And if you have two different kernel for each group, so you have a total of eight output channels, what you will do is simply applying here on each part two different kernels, but the blue kernels will never see the orange one as you had before with the group one. Next, we have the bias. If you remember from your networks, a bias is something that is added after we have a transformation. As you may have very well heard of it, we take an input, we multiply it by a way, we add a bias, and next we activate. What we do with convolutional neural networks is exactly the same. You have an input, you apply convolution, which will be the kernel from which way to try to learn, and afterwards you will add another value on all the different parts of the output you get from the kernel, which is called the bias that you can find here. And allowing to have a bias might help the system to find the inherent bias there is in the dataset to provide a better output. There are multiple strengths in convolution neural network. The first is the fact that you have a position invariant. The main idea is that if you're able to detect here someone, the kernel that detected the someone here should be able to detect all the people you have here on the down part of the image, even up to here, where you have the possibility to detect another person with the exact same kernel. If we use a dense neural network where we use all the pixels we have here, we will need, if we detect someone here, to relearn what is a person on the other part of the image, because the pixels are considered separately with different weight every time. And this is also a problem to use a single weight for every different part of the image, because if you have this basic image of 475 by 625 with three channels, and we use a fully dense connected layers, we will use that each neuron will represent nearly 900,000 parameters because it will need to be connected to all the different pixels you have. While if we apply 32 kernels, so 32 features detectors, 32 scanners in this image to be able to output a signal, we'll use only nearly 900 parameters to so 1000 less parameters on this image. And if you want to compute how many parameters, it's very easy. We have three by three kernels, like here, on three channels, we had next the bias inherent to each kernel, and we will have here 32 kernels, which lead to a total number of 896. Next, a good strength of convolution neuron is about parallelization. Each convolution of a kernel can be computed at the same time of the others. So every part of the image can be computed at the same time by the kernels and each kernel of a layer can be computed at the same time. This is extremely good and not the case for recurrent neural networks. So even if you have it for dense neural networks, we have seen that it's not good as the number of parameters and the fact that it doesn't uh, detect patterns, but even recurrent neural networks that will try to detect patterns do not allow this strong parallelization. And if you wonder why parallelization is important, I will invite you to look at a video I already published and the link is in the description below. Also, another great strength about the different convolutional networks we use is the possibility of transfer learning. Transfer learning is a very easy concept where 
you train a first neural networks as it has seen very different images from very different fields like people, animals, cars, plane, etc. And you will apply the different images to train your neural network. What you will have here is just a classifier of fully connected layers. What you can do is reuse this frozen part that detected the features because if you're able to detect a circle to detect an eye, it can also be used to detect a wheel. And if you want to apply it to any other kind of image visualization, you will still be able to reuse these features that have been detected. So you take them in what we call the frozen part, and you will just consider that you do not change the weight anymore of the kernels. You just reuse them. And afterwards, you will just apply another part here, the training part, that will be only the parameters you train. So you will be able to train on the features you detected. And even working with far different elements of visual recognitions, like analyzing a spectrogram, you can still use transfer learning for features that have been detected to train a classifiers to differentiate between cats and dogs. This is something very strong about uh, the fact that the features are very universal at the beginning by detecting very simple patterns. In such a way, this makes the frozen part a very useful tool. But not only to be able to not have to retrain, it can be used also to compress your data sets. And this is something I did for my master when I have been able to just perform a dimensionality reduction of 99.9%. And how was this possible? I just used my images that I passed in the frozen part to generate a very small output compared to the big size of my images I had before, and I just saved it. And by saving on the different hard drives I had, I had to run nearly a thousand different computers uh, to, to do this project, but I just had to copy a very small file because all the dimensions had been previously reduced by the frozen part of the neural network, which made this very strong to reduce the full size of the dataset. Next, we'll just review list of application of convolutional networks. There are far more than what I will explain, but just to show you what you can do with this technology. The first and the most obvious one, as you may heard, is image recognition. If you want to detect specific features, you can do it to detect features of an image. And convolutional networks have been very strong about that. However, today we see that they might lead the place to what we call transformers, but still, they remain very strong to detect specific patterns we have. They can be also very good for what we call image segmentation. The idea you have here is you get an image and you want to know specifically what are the different structures I have in my image, but also where are they? And this is what you would use as a predictive mask here based on uh, lunar craters in these examples. So you have here the moon, a picture of it, you will try to train on this target and you will be able next to detect where the different patterns are on your specific images. And you can see here, so it's from Facebook AI team, where they have been able to have very, very smooth determination of the area of the segmented individual here, playing tennis with the different element of the sport by very, very fine details. And this is what convolutional networks are very good at detecting very specific features of the patterns. What you can use also convolutional neural networks in is for deep reinforcement learning. Because even if you try to predict the specific reward that you will get by performing an actions, you will need for this to get an input. And this input can be an image. So if you have an image, you can use it to detect features of the image. So if you are training on Atari games like that, you can detect here a key your characters and the different enemies or even the point you have right here. And this will be a very strength of the neural networks as you can also use a transfer learning to not have to pre-train this by your deep reinforcement learning algorithm. As you can see here, we can also perform sentiment analysis. So I have a sentence here and I try to determine if the sentence, I like this song, is something positive or negative. And what I can do is use 1D CNN because I just have a sequence of data, I don't have 2D images. What I would do with that could also be to use recurrent neural networks and they tend to be better than CNNs for that. I could also use a transformer which is even better than LSTM and CNN. But let's have it with the approach of CNN. So what you would do is tokenize every single element of your sentence. I use also the token stop that can be used here to mention that the sentence is ended and there is also different elements that we call lemmatization. But for that, I will just make it the system very simple. 
I just have tokens where i is represented by a zero, like by a one, this by a two, and so on. And what I will do is pass this token in what we call an embedding layer that will be able to represent this in several dimensions. What I will have at the output will be a batch size because I have multiple sentences that I will train at the same time, like you would have multiple images that you train at the same time on your um, neural network. I will have a sentence length, which is determined by the number of parameters. So here we have a total of five. So sentence length would be equal to five. And I have a dimension that is determined by my embedding layer. And we will explain this right now. What you see here is what we call word to vec, where each word is represented in a 3D space. What I can do is having some dimensions representing let's say the gender of an individual. Here, I see the axis here will tend to present as a small value masculine characters, while as a higher value feminine characters. I have a specific dimension here that represents the gender of the individual. And I would have another here dimension that would be able to represent the wealth of the individual. The king might be more than a man. And even then, how you would create that would be to have the same distance between king and queen than you would have between man and woman and the same distance between king and man as you would have for queen and woman. At the same time, I could do it also with a different tense of the verb I have here or to associate the different regions of specific words. What I had was different tokens and now I have for each tokens multiple dimensions and in fact these dimensions are your input channels. If I have here three different dimensions, I will work with three channels of a 1D CNN. And as I mentioned here, the number of input channels is determined by the dimensions of your embedding layer. Next, I would stack several layers of 1D CNN. And what I could do was to train this to know if the sentiment was positive or negative by CNNs, by parallelization, which is something very strong. And I will also provide different other examples like speech detection if you want to detect whether someone specifically is speaking or if you have different people talking to each other. You could also use to detect words on audio signals. You could also train autonomous surgical robots, ECG interpretation. And this is what I'm doing for my medical test today. Also do some kind of optical character recognition where you have just pages of the book and you try to just have them numerically. Well, even if they are printed, you can apply an artificial intelligence to convert it and to get back the text that was used to print the book. You could also use to recognize people using their face and even if they cover the face, you can use to train their gait. And this is something which is very used today in China to recognize people with their systems. That uses also CNNs. You could also do to detect uh, and to generate 3D environments where in the specific architecture go generative address neural network, you have a discriminator that tries to detect whether something is fake generated by another algorithm or if it comes from the data set. And this can be done by using a specific kernel that is a 3D kernel where you have 3D environments or 3D kernels and you're able to progressively train a neural network to learn to generate environment by using convolution on the discriminator size. I hope you liked this video. If it does so, please subscribe. And if you have comments, please leave them below.